today, I'd like to welcome Jim Senel. He joined NextCore as president in 2009 to further their mission of creating entrepreneurship and innovation-based regional growth. NextCore has helped more than 800 companies over the past five years. Kunal Falfer understands the battery potential of the Great Lakes. He is Lifecycle's chief commercial officer and has extensive international experience in the lithium ion battery and renewable energy sectors. Stacy Weissmiller is the senior manager, New York City for Second Muse, an impact firm dedicated to designing, developing, and implementing entrepreneurial programs for manufacturing. Terry Tabor is a well-known chief technical officer experienced in R&D as it relates to innovation. He is the senior vice president, advanced materials and chemicals at the Eastman Kodak Company. And our panel chair for this panel is Ben Jacobs, associate publisher and editor of the Daily Record and the Rochester Business Journal, City Ages partner in this edition of The Big Spend. Please welcome our panel. I'll leave it to you, Ben, to uh, harness this panel of planning power. <laughs> Thank you, Naomi, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for this uh, interesting and important topic. I, I have found the, the previous presentation to be very informative, and I hope you have as well. Uh, we don't have a ton of time, so I want to get right into questions, and, and I want to start off with asking each of the panelists to just touch briefly on, on how Rochester has built an economy around clean energy and what other communities in the Great Lakes region can learn from Rochester's example. And Jim, if you want to start off. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thanks, Ben, um, and thanks again for having us. Um, you know, Rochester um, clean tech has been a, a focus area and a pillar of uh, for economic growth and economic development strategically for many years. Going back about 15 years ago, I was involved in putting a strategic plan together with the U.S. Green B Building Council, and really looked at what are the current assets of the region, uh, and with a lot of materials expertise, chemicals, films at places like Kodak, fuel cell R&D centers here, just a lot of talent. And where can those assets really apply to help future growth? And so it's that strategic plan that's kind of driven our, our regional economy for, for many years. Um, our role today is focused on startup companies, and we'll get to that um, later. But my advice to other regions would be look at the assets that you've got and build yeah. around that. Terry, do you want to go next? You've also had a big role in Rochester's emergence here. Sure. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I think it, there are three things I would add to what Jim said. One is a cooperative nature uh, across public, private, as well as uh, academic and industrial and several other vectors, but those are two key ones. Uh, the creativity and uh, innovative nature of this region uh, that spans uh, through the universities to the companies of, of this region. And the third thing, and Jim really touched upon this, is the infrastructure. What are the capabilities? Where are the existing assets? What can you build on? What are the core, um, you know, uh, the inherent uh, competencies of the region and how does that apply to clean energy? You know, you might have a, a interesting perspective here as someone who has started in, in Canada and, and expanded into Rochester and on what you've seen in, in this economy here. Yeah, for sure. I think Jim and Terry touched upon it, but we've located now built one facility and building another facility on the Kodak Park and some of the points they touched upon infrastructure, whether that's utilities or, or logistical infrastructure, rail infrastructure, uh, the labor pool to, to feed into a chemical type operation. So we're recycling lithium ion batteries, a very chemical intensive uh, application and also the facilities on the Kodak Park uh, in terms of analytical labs and expertise there is what attracted us to Rochester, in addition, it helped us to, you know, add on fact is that it's not that far from our headquarter on the other side of the lake in Toronto, um, which a couple of hours to get to Rochester, two and a half hours. So that helps us easily make it back and forth between our HQ and one of our, our biggest cities in terms of uh, facilities. But, um, you know, in the Great Lakes region, it's one of the few, uh, I think, places we identified with that type of infrastructure that could be retooled for clean energy. Stacey, what are your thoughts on what you've seen in Rochester and what other communities can kind of copy from us? Sure. So I'm located in New York City. Uh, we work very closely with Jim and the Next Core group. And I think one of the really important things is working across the state of New York. What you recognize is that uh, there's innovation bubbles in a lot of the larger urban centers like that of New York City, but they actually take advantage of a lot of the infrastructure, as mentioned before. 
uh, in places like Rochester, which is actually really phenomenal for a lot of innovators and people who are looking to commercialize. So I've seen that as an extreme advantage of people who are in the New York State region of being able to be really cross-functional. Um, also, as mentioned before, the public-private partnerships uh, policy has played a huge role in why we've been able to really um, amplify the region and, and bring some of that innovation to places like Rochester. I'm a native of Erie, PA, so I uh, am a Great Lakes kid, and I would love to see how some of these other uh, cities, but quite frankly, regions can, uh, you know, use their urban centers, use those innovation bubbles and really try to uh, push people to use some of that infrastructure that is there in, in the Great Lakes region. Great, thank you all. And our, our audience includes uh, a number of entrepreneurs. Uh, so Jim and Stacey, I was hoping you could touch on how someone can get involved in, in one of these new energy opportunities that we see spring up. Sure, if I can take a, a stab at that and then uh, Stacy can jump in, but we're partners on a couple of different programs, so we have some similar answers. But um, in general, so NextCore, um, a lot of what we do is focused on helping tech entrepreneurs launch new companies and we operate a startup incubator. We have four startup accelerator programs in different industry verticals and some programs that support manufacturers. And two of those accelerator programs are in the climate tech space in partnership with Stacy's group at Second Muse. One on pre-formation stage called Venture for Climate Tech and the other on scale for climate tech. How do you scale up, particularly on the, on the production side? And so, um, you know, we see lots of demand. Um, I would say, you know, anyone doing a startup company is somebody that's trying to solve a problem. If there isn't a problem, there isn't a market. And the good news is in this climate tech space, there's a lot of opportunities <laughs> um, and it's a hot space and there's a lot of folks with great ideas. In fact, we had over 600 applicants to our recent cohort in the For Climate Tech uh, program from all over the world. And so there's a lot of coming to this region um, and getting connected to this kind of New York State assets like people talked about. So for a startup, it's a hot space, you know, find some programs that can help you take your idea through the usual kind of customer discovery, product market fit, validation sort of phases um, in a cohort that can connect you with this global network of resources and experts and national labs and other stuff. Um, and so that'd be my advice to a startup is find a program that's, that's an expert in this field and that'll help accelerate your growth significantly. But I'll let Stacy add to that. Yeah, I will add that our applications will open in July for our cohort for the SCALE program, which again is mentioned, um, focused on commercialization and manufacturing. The one thing I can say is that New York State itself is really, um, you know, it's a test bed for uh, this kind of climate action and for innovators to come have access to places like New York City, but also places like Rochester. So if you're really looking for a place where you're going to have the full scope of people and uh, programs to support you, but also a variety of different geographies to be able to deploy these items. New York State is the place. Thank you both for summarizing some of those uh, opportunities available to startups and prospective entrepreneurs. Uh, Kanal, I wanna turn to you now to talk about, you've, you've had some experience working through some of these problems and, and expanding uh, at Lifecycle. What sorts of business opportunities and barriers have you experienced through that expansion process? Yeah, I mean, our business expansion was really guided by where we're going to see batteries coming out of uh, the market and uh, or batteries produced and and generate scrap to go into our facility for for one type of our facility, what we call our front end spoke, and then. Uh, the hub was really guided by finding again that centralized location that had the infrastructure, and that's why that that's a more critical site selection in terms of selecting the, the Kodak Park uh, to leverage the infrastructure. So, I mean, the opportunity when we look at energy storage, et cetera, or EVs is rapidly growing. There's more and more batteries being deployed. Um, you know, I think the the challenge has always been to scale up lockstep with the industry, right? So there's been plans for electrification for a long time. There's been plans for EV production, but now it's coming into fruition and, and we need to scale capacity uh, with some foresight as to when, you know, waste will be generated. And that's, I think, the real challenge of scaling that capacity at the right rate and then funding it. So obviously now going public, we've solved the funding problem and now the next challenge is, is scaling the human capital and, and getting the right people as we grow quickly. Terry, uh, Kodak's role in, in shaping 
Rochester's landscape throughout the, the 20th century is well documented, but what role has Kodak played in Rochester reimagining those historic assets to build future industries? Yes, uh, uh, excellent question. And I, there, there are three or four com, uh, components of that. First is recognizing that uh, the materials assets in terms of uh, small scale to large scale production of materials, as well as our uh, machines to do row to row manufacturing, again, at small scale or large scale, can be applied to another, uh, a number of industries. And clean energy was one that we selected and so we started uh, looking at the capability to deposit materials, uh, to do component manufacturing uh, in a continuous mode uh, for batteries, fuel cells, primarily electrodes, but we've done separators as well. And so that was the first start uh, is, you know, you look inside, what can we do uh, ourselves? Uh, we have these great assets. We always have, also have a knowledge base uh, around materials and deposition that goes back decades. Uh, the second part was, you know, looking at uh, uh, are there other companies and life cycle as and all has already shared that they're uh, on our campus. Uh, there are a number of other uh, clean energy companies on our campus. So it's a willingness to bring uh, uh, companies to to the campus to build an ecosystem of a variety of approaches to clean energy. Uh, and that's been extremely valuable and uh, valuable from some of the points that uh, can all mention for a life cycle in terms of in infrastructure uh, that supports that, but also the interactions that occur uh, by having so many different uh, uh, companies, different thoughts around clean energy in the same location. And then I would just say that uh, Kodak's openness, uh, particularly with our new CEO, Jim Continenza, to, to look at building a clean energy ecosystem uh, within the campus here in Rochester that goes from R&D to production to assembly. Kodak can participate in parts of that, and we'd be looking for companies like Lifecycle and others to participate in other parts of it so that we could have a complete ecosystem around clean energy. So, um, you know, we bring assets, we bring know-how, we bring the ability to, uh, to partner, collaborate, but also to bring companies on site, which gives us a, you know, a strong geographic uh, advantage in terms of the interactions. Thank you for that perspective. And if any of the audience members have any questions for these panelists and, and what, what their uh, focus is, um, please feel free to use the Q&A function. Um, so, Stacy, we just heard Terry talk about what Kodak and Rochester have been able to do to capitalize on that legacy infrastructure from, from Kodak's um, past. What advice would you have for other communities in the Great Lakes region on, on what they should be considering as they look at whatever legacy infrastructure they have available to them? Yeah, first I would start by saying I actually have a lot of teams in our program that are very focused on using those assets from Kodak, which I think is exactly what a lot of other people in the Great Lakes region needs to be thinking about is what are those assets that they have? What is the knowledge base that they already have? And how can they push that forward to then engage the innovation sector? Um, again, mentioning I'm from Erie, right? You have to really understand like, what is the infrastructure that certain Great Lakes regions have? You're gonna have Detroit in the auto industry. I grew up as a kid at uh, GE Transportation, right? So every single one of these areas is going to have some level of infrastructure that really we should be thinking about how to push that forward and how to connect innovation to those places where R&D um, commercialization can happen because that infrastructure uh, is number one, not going away. Uh, and number two is infrastructure that quite frankly does not just um, come up in a year or two, right? It is heavy industrial infrastructure that is should be used to capitalize on, on those innovators. Yeah, and we've, apart from, from infrastructure, another thing we've heard uh, a lot of discussion about is the Finding these relationships that, that can help develop uh, these ecosystems as, as companies and organizations work together. What goes into to finding and facilitating those relationships and, and then growing them into this kind of mutually beneficial ecosystem that, that can help us develop clean energy? Terry, you want to start off? Sure, I'd be glad to. So uh, I think, you know, it's 
it's being proactive and understanding what you can do within clean energy and what you can't do. And what you can't do, you start to look for partners or collaborators that would make the synergy of the two more powerful and coming up with a, with a solution in this space. And you know those conversations as with any good partnership uh, need to be pretty open and transparent on uh, skills and strengths and you know what truly are the synergies and then how do you build on those? You have to have a collaborative nature. You have to be transparent. Uh, you really need to uh, open a number of conversations, uh, particularly in this space, which is you know very demanding uh, in finding solutions. It's going to require a lot of creativity and know-how. It's it's not likely to exist in one uh, uh, one entity. It's going to cut across uh, R and D groups and manufacturing groups and uh, really, as I mentioned earlier, public and private groups to really make this uh, work and not only work, but become part of our fabric into the future. So it's, it's a lot of basics of uh, uh, exploring uh, and finding a potential overlap uh, where you can build something together that's stronger than you can apart. Uh, and Kodak does that in our own way, but I know some of my other panelists <laughs> or experts of this, uh, but we're always open to a conversation. Uh, if there's a potential collaborator or partner in this space, uh, be willing to, to chat with anybody uh, who feels like the, they um, would like to see what Kodak can do, the facilities that might be available. You know, we're open to that, certainly uh, uh, to start any conversation along the clean energy line. Any of the other panelists want to weigh in on the that question? I'll just amplify what Terry said again. Um, the, the partnership, if a region wants to kind of get itself more into the clean energy sectors, um, it does take um, a lot of collaboration um, to again, understand your assets. Long time ago, right? Everyone said, we're gonna be the clean tech capital of the world. If they had any <laughs> assets in that space or not. We'll probably see the same thing with quantum. We'll probably see the same thing with other things, right? And so understanding what pieces you're good at, clean tech is huge, right? Maybe it's like Terry said, there's a film, um, thin film capability and materials capability as one nugget. And you say, where could you go with that? Well, maybe solar applications or fuel cell membranes and other stuff. Um, but getting your whole public private community on board, the economic development community on board, the universities to really all agree and understand. So you're singing from the same hymn book as you're out in the rest of the world, I think is a, a very important thing. Great. We have a couple of questions from the audience. I'll start with this one um, from Simeon. Curious about observations on who is creating clean tech startups. Is it recent college grads, mid-career professionals changing industries? Are you noticing any trends out there? No, I, I would say from our end, uh, we get a lot of um, lab technology. So a lot of technology out of some of the national labs. Um, also, we recently opened up our... Um, cohort to a global footprint and we are getting a variety of um, entrepreneurs out of Canada. Uh, we're getting a lot of uh, plugs out of kind of Western Europe and a lot are early stage, you know, uh, recent grads who are interested in, in really hitting this market and because it's a place of impact and for social good. Other entrepreneurs have, you know, been in a lab for decades working on a very, very deep tech uh, process or product. So it really rain, it's a range. Um, I think to Jim and Terry's point earlier, clean tech is very huge, right? Um, so it can encompass everything from water tech to, you know, snow melting systems. I think ultimately what it is, is it's also fun, right? There is something about clean tech that is knowing that you're waking up every day, you're working on a product or a solution, and ultimately you know it's going to go help something. So we see um, a variety of entrepreneurs in this space. And ultimately, that is actually, in my opinion, something that's really important to the innovation is seeing uh, a variety of people from different geographies, from different backgrounds. Um, I think that's actually what makes clean tech uh, better uh, as we kind of continue down this path. Any other thoughts on the trends on who you're seeing in this space? 
I agree with Stacey. It's a very broad mix. When you look at stats on average age of people creating tech startups in general, it's actually much older than most people would think. I think it's, I don't know, 40 years old or 40 something years old. Um, so we do see a lot of early stage student kind of research sorts of things, but um, you know, I think the majority are folks that have been in industry, they've seen a problem and they've thought of some solutions to it, but it's a big mix. We have a, another question from, from Paul. Uh, from a regional point of view, what are the barriers to sharing power from Niagara Falls outside of New York State? Uh, just as, a, as one example, while well, New York City has a lot of demand, cities like Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and Detroit, yeah, Canada are actually closer to Niagara Falls and are part of the Great Lakes Basin. Any of you have any thoughts on, on what might go into sharing? Probably a panel of a lot of policy experts. <laughs> That's what I would say. That's maybe the next thing that we should plan. But yeah, I'm assuming it is a cross-border statewide policy initiative that would really need to take off. Yeah, and I would assume there's infrastructure issues, right? You have to have the interconnectivity uh, between the states and provinces to, to move the power. Great. We just uh, also got a, a question about um, the possibility of wind turbines in Lake, on Lake Erie and Ontario. Does any of the panelists have any thoughts about um, what what that would be like or what um, the potential yeah. of wind turbines in the lakes? I mean, I think uh, you see it all over Europe, offshore Denmark, UK, et cetera. Earlier in my, when I was doing engineering, this was probably mid 2000s, uh, I worked for an engineering company in the city of Toronto, tried to put an anemometer to measure the wind speed in Lake Ontario. And uh, there's a lot of what they call nimbyism here in Ontario with, uh, you know, it's five kilometers or three, four miles out in the lake. You're not going to see this thing, or even if there's a turbine, some people find it quite soothing, but the community was able to, uh, Turn that you know turn that project around, and I think that's not right. My personal opinion is that's not the right approach. I think there is an opportunity in the lakes to put wind turbines and and, and capture the uh, the wind flow there. Uh, and I think the, the community, both sides of the border, should explore that further for sure. Go. Okay, I'm glad you mentioned the border because that's one thing we we haven't really discussed yet. And you know, obviously your your company is in both countries. What role does the border play, um, obviously, both in, in normal times and now things are a little bit different during the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, during the pandemic with the border closure, you know, we have benefited from, uh, you know, technically recycling as part of waste management as a central service. So a couple of our colleagues have visas and actually mine's ready now too. to, you know, under normal conditions, you could just travel across the border, but now as an essential worker, we would need visas to be able to cross border. I mean, we did manage to scale up our Rochester plant and team from colleagues in Canada here managing that. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's quite inconvenient right now uh, because my team, the commercial teams in Canada and the customers want to come see the Rochester plant. And so we're, you know, doing a lot of stuff virtually. Uh, but I, I think under ordinary times, the, you know, it's it's not a big deal. Uh, we do move batteries when we only had a can Canadian facility across the border. Everything's pretty, you know, it, you have to go through the paperwork, but it's it's possible. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the border hasn't really caused us any, any issues uh, besides the pandemic. Okay. Thank, I want to thank all the panelists for their expertise today. I found it very interesting. I hope our audience did as well. Uh, and I'll uh, hand things back over to Naomi to wrap up our program for the day.